this world without this book. And, uh, well, you know, the way I, I phrase it is this, this way, you know, if, if me, if, if I didn't look at things through the Bible, you know, through the lens of the Bible, I couldn't get up in the morning, as I've shared with you before, I couldn't get up in the morning and just make sense of all this. I don't know that I could find any motivation to want to do anything because it wouldn't make sense, but the Bible helps us to yeah. have it make sense. Jump off the subject for a second, son, which you said last week, Sunday. I got a lot of Spurgeon sermons. He said the same thing you said. He blamed the pulpit for the way the country was going. The word of God was not going to preach on that. And you said the same thing as the Well, that's what Finney said, and they lived around at the same time. Yeah, well, yeah, well, like I said, Spurgeon and Finney lived in the same 19th century. And remember that Spurgeon, um, I'll tell you in a second, uh, Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, near the end of his ministry, didn't have the type of popularity he did when he was 19 years old. He was filling up huge auditoriums. Um, and they had to build a metropolitan tabernacle to contain the crowds. <clears throat> but as uh, in Europe, uh, in England in particular, as they got into what was called the downgrade theory, you know, taking out, eviscerating the Bible, taking out the supernatural and all that stuff, uh, he fought against it and he lost a lot of friends. A lot of, a lot of the students left his college and all that. So what Mario brought up was the fact that I was sharing how Finney stated that if in America, he was dealing with America, if, there's, if the government's gone uh, wrong, the pulpit's to blame. If there's problems in the country, the pulpit is to blame, and we went through other things that he said. And Mario just brought up that Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, said the same thing. I'm just simply saying, even though they were on two continents, two different continents, they lived in the same time period, and, you know, when we study, and we've studied history here as, as far as church history, we've studied American history, uh, we see, you know, these, these things were going on concurrently in Europe, not so much in America then, but we certainly have it, we certainly have it now. Anyway, um, when we look at the times that we live in, and I could, you know, go off of that thought there, and you look at the church, the way I study the church, look what I look, the way I look at the church. Yeah, I think, in my mind, definitely the pulpit is is the the factor. But it's been going on for you know we've studied this. It's been going on for a long, long time. So I'm thinking of you know some of the things that we see here in America. Um, we have quite a few people that are watching now from a lot of different countries overseas, a lot, a lot of them in Africa, but also India and Malawi and all these places. So everybody has a different view of their own country and what's going on. But it all could be related back to violating the principles of Scripture. Now, though it's not funny, when you see 16, there was 34 people arrested yesterday for protesting against uh, the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision to overthrow. And uh, 34 people were arrested, 16 of them were members of Congress. And you have people like uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez with her hands behind her back, so you think she's handcuffed, yes, and she's not. And neither was Ilhan Omar. And I think to myself, you know, back in the 60s, I mean, real protesters got arrested. You know, I, I don't know what this, this crazy game is, but, and it's certainly not humorous, but you shake your head. You're just like, wow. Now, it, now this is the so-called humorous part. For me, when Mark Twain was trying to explain 
the definition of an idiot. He says, now suppose you were an idiot. And then again, he says, suppose you were a member of Congress. He said, but I, I repeat myself. So when I, when I think of that and our current situation, you know, again, not a lot has changed because human nature hasn't changed, Satan hasn't changed, and God hasn't changed. What has changed, as I always remind you, is technology, world population. And those are the two main factors that we see that is drastically, especially uh, technology, is dramatically different in our generation than in any other generation. So, we have all of this going on all the time, and uh, for the, some of you watch the Oasis, the broadcast I do for anxiety and depression. Uh, what, you know, what I was sharing this week and share with you, if our mind, well, let me say it this way, we really become what our mind is focused on. I mean, I'm not saying if you focus on God, you become God. I'm just saying that when you focus on the Word of God, your mind is zeroed in on these principles, these teachings, these commands, prophecies. When your mind is focused on other things out there, and it could be anything, then you, you kind of drift with that. You, you go with that. So I started to say, for me, I couldn't, honestly couldn't make sense of this world without this book. So I'm so grateful that as a young man, the Lord, uh, you know, called me and led me in my bedroom by myself, had never met a preacher, had never met a born-again Christian, uh, I had never met anybody that knew the Lord or tutored me or taught, taught me anything, just in, uh, intuitively, I guess, I just picked up the Bible and started to read it <laughs> all on my own. And, you know, I, I, I didn't get it. It was a difficult book, but in the course of time, as God kept leading me, uh, I came to a knowledge of the truth. Without that, boy, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I, I always wandered to myself. I always have. How in, now, I, I say intelligent people. I don't mean necessarily people with high IQs. I just mean just the average person who can think common sense, common knowledge. How do you get up in the morning and say, what well, is gonna be great? Unless you're living solely for yourself and are under the delusion that we're not connected to other people, because we are. Have any of you ever heard of this six steps of separation? It's a theory that now is becoming more and more plausible. It's interesting, I read a book on it. And what that theory states is that at any given point of time, we are only six people removed from anybody on the face of the earth. That means the President of the United States or the, you know, uh, the shoemaker over in Europe or who, the farmer, only six points away, six points of separation. And it was a theory, and now it's becoming more and more plausible. And there's tests that have been done. And, in sociology to prove that this is actually true. And even if it isn't precisely six people, what I'm saying is that we are definitely all connected on the planet. Doesn't matter where we live, we're all connected and one thing affects the other. So for me, without the book that we're gonna start right now, not just James, I mean the Bible, I couldn't get up in the morning and make sense of this world. I really couldn't. Things just don't make sense to me. But when I read the book and I bring my thoughts and bring it through the filter of the Bible and what I've learned over the years, I say to myself, I'm so grateful, I really am, for um, what I know and hopefully what you know. All right. So we're in the epistle of James. Let's read again just for our introduction who James is who he's writing to, and we'll take it from there. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So the first thing we learn is it's written by James, who is, we'll call him the half-brother 
of Jesus himself. And he's also writing to a, specific, a specifically Jewish audience where the entire Bible is written by Jews. But here, you know, we have an epistle, well, the book of Hebrews that precedes it, that gives it away. It's written to Jewish people who professed a faith in Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, which we do as well. <clears throat> so, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. And he starts right in, I told you James is a type of a counterpart the way it's written to the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. So we have these things we're about to read. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers various types of temptations. So that's, a, we're going to see this in a little bit. The testing of our faith and all of this. It's not natural for anybody who's going through any type of trial, as small as it may be on the scale of history, to say, you know, this is, this is great. Frustration. If you <coughs> will come to the point in life to understand there's going to be frustrations, and there's going to be a lot of frustrations, then you're going to be less prone to being frustrated. And the reason being is that you're expecting something's going to happen. All right? But ordinarily, when it happens, like Murphy's Law, it just happens, it seems like it happens at the most inconvenient time, uh, or the most inconvenient place, and so on. Now again, if you watch the show, The Oasis, the brief, you know, 15 minute uh, exhortation teaching I give on anxiety and depression, it is, and it happened again today, it's just phenomenal, it really is. It's phenomenal how often my broadcast is interrupted by uh, planes, trains. I was sitting in the field uh, about a year ago and said, well, if at Fort Hunter, I said, this is a good place, you know, nice. I pick quiet settings, right? I pick quiet settings on purpose. A is primarily set, uh, you know, the background for people to kind of, you know, enjoy the, the scenery a little bit. And I'm sitting in the field, and I'm not, I'm not kidding you, a black ops, because you can tell them right away when you see them, helicopter came over. So, you know, it was one thing to be making the noise, and the microphone's picking it up, but it started circling me. <laughs> now, I'm not prone to paranoia, so I, you know, I figured maybe now I became part of the training that they were doing. I assume that's what they were doing. <laughs> Another time I'm in the field, and the... Uh, a lady's dog gets off the leash. I even know the people that own the dog. And she's running across and I'm talking to the people, so don't be anxious. The dog's all over the place. Today, a motorcycle comes by, whoa, whoa, and he's playing music, music really, really loud. I usually do the broadcast at the end of a period of meditation. So let's say I'm sitting there for an hour and just meditating and thinking, which is what I've done all my life. And it's so quiet. Then I, when I go to put on the camera, and they needed to be quiet, just things, just things start to happen. Uh, some, there was something banging in the woods today. It's, it's funny. And the people who've been watching, some have been watching like for two straight years, that's how long I've been doing the broadcast. Um, you know, they, they understand it. It, like it happens like all the time. Trains go by, but not when I'm sitting there meditating or, or praying or studying or whatever I'm doing. It's just very quiet. And all of a sudden I turn the camera on and all, <clears throat> all hell breaks loose. But this is an example of, so I'm sharing with you that uh, I expect this to happen for whatever reason it happens when I'm doing this little 15 minute broadcast. But in life in general, if we can come to the truth that frustrations are part of life, we're gonna be less frustrated when they happen because we expected it. And that's wisdom. All right, so what, what James is saying here, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, different types of temptations. Of course, the early church had more than just frustrations. They had severe persecution. 
Knowing this, that the trying or testing of your faith works patience. So, if, if we, now look at it, it don't matter how old you are now. If your habit has been of handling frustrations in anger and in kicking things and throwing things, you know, maybe you were like, you said, I was like that when I was a kid, and now you're older and getting older, and you're still doing the same thing. That means you haven't learned this principle. That means you don't have patience. Now, you know, in my own way, I, I've been an impatient individual in certain areas of life. And then, you know, once you, you have to step back again, like I just said, and say, you know what? These things happen. Why am I... In fact, if you cast your eyes over here at verse 20, same chapter 1, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So if you permit me use of the word stupid, <laughs> we were all stupid when we were young, right? But it's not to our credit if we're still stupid when we're getting older, you know? For those of us that are getting older, well, everybody here in this room is getting older. just depends on what age you are now, but... And you're still reacting the same way. What that means is that you haven't learned. You haven't taken the training of multiple frustrations, interruptions, of, I mean, it could be anything that's tr testing your faith. Testing your faith in, in God and in Christ and what he said. I, when I was turning to the book of James earlier to review, I just happened to pass by through Matthew and a verse you know, came out. And uh, it's Jesus saying, why, call, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? All right, so we've been through those sermons before. Well, you know, I mean, and we read again in Proverbs, wisdom is the principal thing. And so, you know, it goes on to say, with all, all your getting, get knowledge, but if we keep repeating the same things over and over and over again, it means we're not learning. We're not, we're not learning anything. Me, especially if it's a severe trial, I always, try to, I always say to myself, okay, what am, I, what am I supposed to be learning from this? I'm not con as concerned of what everybody else is learning, if they're learning. I'm concerned about what am I supposed to be learning? Is this a time for me to be quiet and silent and not answer that? Or is this the time for me to speak up and say something? What am I supposed to be learning? And you're supposed to be learning. And we're supposed to be becoming more patient, again, as we age in the Lord. We're just age, period. And so he says that the testing of your faith, maybe this was something that we, well, I know it was something I did not expect when I first signed on, I'll follow Jesus. And you hear messages, you know, on faith, and everything is, it always works out well. I mean, well, when you have faith, it does work out well. But so many preachers tell it in such a way that you get the picture that faith just makes life like super simple. That was my expectation. That has not been the result at all. Just the opposite. More frustrations, more complications, more obstacles and on and on and on, but I wasn't prepared for that because I was a novice at the time. Now, so many of you sitting here, I don't know about you watching by way of television, but so many of you sitting here are not novices. So by now you should know that your faith is going to be tested. Now we'll read over here, verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. Now God does test our faith, but Primarily, we're up against our own flesh, our own misunderstandings, misconceptions, and Satan. That's the primary uh, consideration for what, what leads us to these things, the testing of our faith. But just let's be clear about this. True faith is tested. And uh, your faith is going to be tested and tested again and again. Maybe I should say this too, and I think I mentioned it recently. The older I get, and, and particularly in the Lord, the, the more I look at people that, you know, 
or doing things that are either evil or wicked or bad or just, just you know, the average person is just making a lot of mistakes. Earlier, in my earlier, younger years, you know, that would frustrate me and I feel very frustrated by that. But now, as I get older, and, and I know more of the Lord and His book, I, I actually feel compassion. I just say to myself, look at how un unwise they are. They, they, they're foolish. So you don't want to be in that crowd. You're not supposed to be in that crowd. You're supposed to be getting wisdom. Let me also say, so many messages from preachers on the message of the Holy Spirit is the emphasis uh, has so often been on power. And the Holy Spirit does give power. No, no question about that. But whatever happened to wisdom? Whatever happened to God's people being wiser and wiser and wiser? And if you had to register a guess about the behavior of a wise person, it's a gimme because it's written in the book, what do you think their behavior would look like? The wiser somebody gets. As far as their mouth. Yeah, they talk less and less. Not more and more. They think before they talk. They, they, I've always, when I watch people, like I have a few grandchildren, and a couple of them just don't talk a lot. You can see their eyes. I know what's that, in that brain, they're just studying. What's this? And who's this guy with the beard? And what's that all about? Should I get on his lap? And they're just they're calculating. Now, when you, look, when you look at people that are constantly talking, well, the book is, the Bible is very clear about that, that they're not wise. What does it say that, you know, in a multitude of words, I'll paraphrase it, in a multitude of words, there's no lack of sin. So the, the, you'll know you're getting wiser because you're talking less and less. And when you speak, it counts, like, like in fighting and boxing. You want to make sure that you're not just throwing punches and wasting energy. You want to make sure that you, your, your punch is going to count when, when you throw it. All right. So your faith is getting tested. How many of you can say my faith has been tested like recently, like it's really getting tested? Okay, so like we're all there, right? And um, the good thing, like, like again, like boxing, um, when I was trained, I was always fighting men. Not, I was 15 and I was fighting men, professionals that had retired, I was, and I was always getting beat up. The good news about that there is that, as my, my trainer used to always say, when I would come to the corner, he'd whisper in my ear and he'd say, you're getting an education. And true enough, I was. I was learning how not to get beat up. So the testing of your faith it, it brings in its working patience so that you are speaking less and less. Listening, we'll see this in just a second too. Uh, you're listening more and more so you can learn. Okay. Oh, let me add one more thing and I have said this to you before too. When your language is used glibly, just talk glib. It, it always, it always uh, has a tendency to become defeatist. You start to get wound up and you start talking in, in defeatist terms. So when, you, when you're learning and you're becoming more and more patient, you can step back like the old owl sat on an oak. And the more he saw, the less he spoke. And the less he spoke, the more he heard. So it says, why can't we be like that wise old bird? Yeah, whoever keeps his tongue, you put a, a, a muzzle on it. <laughs> You're keeping yourself from trouble. So you speak less, but well, we see that coming up in the text. If any of you lack wisdom, who doesn't? I mean, from time to time on the smallest of things, you lack, we don't know what to do, let him ask of God. And it says he gives to all men liberally. He upbraideth not, 
and it shall be given him. It's a declarative sentence that if we need wisdom and we ask God, we'll get it. Now, let me just state also, but, you know, pastors and teachers and so forth, elders in the church are, are given because, you know, they've accumulated more knowledge and, and presumably the elder is supposed to have more faith than the people he's teaching. But that's the purpose of having elders. But it does say, ask God. And he will give you wisdom. And he won't shove you away. He will give you the wisdom that you need. I would just add that, you know, it doesn't come quite as fast as we would like it, quite as quickly as we would like it, but it comes. So verse 6, we saw this last week. So let him ask in faith, but let him ask in faith. Not wavering, all right? So we talk about a pendulum, you know? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. That's wavering. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth, or wavers, is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. So biblical faith is, is firm. It's, it's solid. It's, it's not going to be moved. It will be attacked. It will be moved upon by you know, the winds of uh, doctrines and teachings and ideology. But it won't be moved. Let me give you an example. Uh, I will, I'll leave the name of the people out, but... Uh, I'm interested in a lot of things, uh, and I read, you know, and there's one, uh, I forget even how I got subscribed to this archaeology magazine that's online, but, so these people put out this stuff. I don't read through a lot of it, just, just too much information for me, but this week, earlier this week, the headline was this. It doesn't matter if the flood ever really happened. It's the, it's the lessons we learned from it. That was the professor, a PhD in uh, some school. <laughs> and my first response was anger. Because like, as I told you on other occasions, we send off young people to the Bible college and we expect them to come back with more faith and they come back with more questions. Now I'm, uh, you know, I'm all for intelligent discussion, intelligent inquiry and study. I do it myself. But that's a red flag right away. It's like, whoa, what do you mean it doesn't matter if the flood happened? It, it, first of all, it matters to the inspiration of scripture. This is a guy with a PhD. So he, let me just say this to you. If someone has lost faith in the Bible, okay, just get out of the pulpit. You don't belong in a church. You don't belong talking to the church. You don't belong teaching the church because you have lost faith and faith, uh, faith in the inspiration of Scripture. The Bible says there was a flood, and then I, I'm not going to go through all the evidence, and that's you know not my, not my domain. But it went on to say it's it's really what's really important is the lessons that we learn. Everybody died but Noah. What lesson is there? I mean, and that wasn't the point. That wasn't the lesson. It was like how we treat each other. I mean, yeah, okay, you can make a point like that, but it does matter if the flood happened. Because if it, if it didn't, then the Bible is wrong. I'm not going to give you the name again of the magazine, but these are professing Christians who do this research, and then they come up with all these different things. And honestly, because I am a thinking man, and I like to read and study and, and so forth, yeah, I think if I was younger, and I remember, remember reading a book, it happened to be written by a Jesuit priest, but it was on the history of the Jews. And the book was, you know, was good, and I got somewhere like in the middle of the book, and the author raised the question that if God was really good and he really loved the Jewish people, why did he let all these things happen? He went through the Holocaust. And I, it, it caught me at this time, we're going, going back 25, 30 years ago. <clears throat> it caught me at a, un, you know, I was unprotected for that. And I entertained that thought for weeks myself until I realized, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You see, you know, we're not alert. It, if you're not alert, these things just slip in. So, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a 
a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. I bet what I was trying to say is biblical faith will be assault, assaulted, it will be attacked, like this magazine article I partially read, and then I had enough. I knew where we was going, and I wasn't going with him. But when we have biblical faith, or I, sh I should say when we don't have biblical faith, a faith that's not wavering, verse 7 tells us right off. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Pretty plain. Couldn't get much plainer than that. So you, you'll hear me say this from time to time. And I'll repeat myself on another issue as well. Number one, why do we even pray? If we don't believe, as we, we read that in 1 John, if we don't believe that God is going to respond, keeping it in the boundaries of the Bible and what we read in 1 John, doing those things that are pleasing in his sight, uh, praying according to his will, it's all in here. We know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. That's good. But let's face it. How many, how many Christians, professing Christians, have you met that have that kind of faith? They just don't waver. They just don't move. They just don't quit. I'm talking about when, when you have the promises that are written right there. There it is. You know, that's biblical faith. Now, I have said this to you, and I think it's a point to continue to drive home. Prayer meetings, wherever they're held in, in Christian churches, if the people who attend any one given church, big or small, truly believed that all, when they come together, or even if you're home alone, and you truly believe God is hearing you, we read that in 1 John, and he's answering because we're asking according to his will, prayer meetings would be, I mean, they would be filled they would be just overflowing with people because they know they're going to get answers from God. They're going to get wisdom that they don't have. And we could, talk, we could throw in healing and other things. But the Bible says here, if a man is wavering, has this kind of a faith, you're not going to receive anything of the Lord. So I've always looked at it this way. Why bother to pray? I don't really believe God's going to answer. It's going to be, again, I use the term... The rolling of the dice. Where's the confidence? I mean, you can't have much confidence if God's not actually uh, listening. Or, uh, you know, have you ever had this experience? Have you ever prayed to God for something that was like decades ago? And then it's coming to pass like decades later? And then you forgot that you even asked God for this? I can't go through the details because I got a lot of things just between God and I. I don't share with my wife. I don't share with anybody. And uh, I'm talking decades and decades. I asked God for something. And then as he was processing me, training me in this area of something I had prayed for, I had forgotten I prayed for it. So I felt the Lord just kind of nudge me in my spirit and say, isn't this what you prayed for? That was a long, long time ago. I mean, a really long time ago. God doesn't forget. But we have got to be the ones who are steadfast. Perfect will not be, but steadfast we must be. And when we pray, we must believe that God is hearing us and is willing to answer us. And by his word, he's going to answer us. Okay. A double-minded man is unstable. In all his ways, or her ways. Double-minded in the, um, the Greek, dipshukas, means two souls. So it's like Bunyan, John Bunyan's uh, character in The Pilgrim's Progress, Mr. Looking Both Ways. Yeah. Here, the Greek word means two souls. Well, which one is it? Many years ago, I, I told this story. It changed one person's life, I know, because he came and told me. And it was a story, it was a true story, of a turtle that had two heads. Now, you know, these anomalies happen in nature. Well, this, this turtle was born with two heads. And one head was fighting with the other head every time food was put in front of the turtle. This is a true story, it's not fiction. So finally, you know, However this works, who knows, inside this, this turtle, 
these, the heads were competing with each other. One of them had to die. And I remember at the end of the message, after using that illustration, asking the, the church, the congregation, say, okay, everybody has you know, this yes and no in them. Which one will you be? And this young person uh, walked over to me that was there at the time. And he said, I'm going to be the one that survives. I'm going to be the one that goes forward with Christ. And he did uh, for a while. Went off to Bible school, went into the pastor. Things did not go so well. Well, they can happen. Uh, and I don't know where he is today. I really don't know. But you see, if, if we look at the center aisle here as the path you know, that Christ leads us on. I am the path. I, when Jesus said, I am the way, the way, the word way means path. I'm the path, and we stay on it. And we're determined to stay on it no matter what. That's biblical faith. But if we, when we, in my opinion, we always come to crossroads where we have an opportunity to go left or right. But we know that the path is going to the right, and so you go to the right. Um, that's biblical faith. There's no wavering. You stick it out. Interestingly, I, I gave you an illustration some weeks back now, maybe a couple months ago, what I do in my own, I play a game in, in my mind. I pretend like I'm the only Christian in the world. I know that I'm not. It's a game that I play so that I'm not dependent on anybody but God himself. Then wouldn't you know it in my devotional time, not the Bible devotion, I mean the reading of the Bible, but a devotional book I read from time to time. Uh, that, that very thing came up, and I forget which of the you know, heavy hitters in Christianity it was, I can't remember. But that very same thing was something that he had practiced. But I didn't get it from him, I came up with it on my own. I just pretend, like there is nobody to help me, though there is. I pretend like I'm the only Christian in the world, though I know I'm not. And it works for me. This way, I'm not looking to man for his final aid but my hope is in Christ and my hope is in God. Uh, that may not work for you, and it's just something that I do, but it's, it's always worked for me. I don't look to man for help, though I know God will move people to help when it's needed. And uh, it works for me. It keeps me from being double-minded. It keeps me single-minded. All right, let's go on to a different topic, verse 9. Let the blood, brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. When we go to 1 Corinthians, we see there, what we still see now, you can go into the average church anywhere in the world, and you're not going to see the rich and the wealthy and the famous. I mean, some of them are in ch ch church, or some of them are born again. But the, you see this, the average person. The person of low degree. And what is a, uh, a testimony to, to the world is that as people like me and you that God uses to confound the wise. I mean, I've, I don't know if you ever talked to any intellectuals. I'm not talking about intelligent people. I'm talking about intellectuals that make their whole the whole persona on, you know, you don't, have, don't you know who I am? Don't you know how smart I am? I heard my wife was telling me a story. She heard as a, you know, the planes have been getting canceled lately. Well, a flight got canceled, lots of people in line. This guy got really torqued, I mean, really twisted. And he's arguing with the, um, the woman, you know, who's uh, making the announcement that flight so and so has been canceled. And um, in, his, in, his, in his anger, he says to the woman, he says, don't you know who I am? So the, she, she was smart enough to get on the microphone and say this. Can somebody please help this guy? He doesn't know who he is. <laughs> Which I thought was a pretty, pretty good response. Don't you know who I am? Like he's asking the question. I don't know who I am. Um, <laughs> people like you and people like me and all around the world, uh, we have average people that God says, you, you follow me. You, follow me. Ordinarily, there are exceptions. Ordinarily, it's not the rich. Ordinarily, it's not the most popular. Ordinarily, it's not the most successful, whatever that may mean, and so on. But people like you and me. And how, do we con how can we confound the wisdom of this world? 
is the wisdom that we learn if we're learning it. But if we're not learning it, the world knows better to say, you blow us off. Because we're no, we're no, if we lose our temper, whatever it may be, the same way everybody else does, how are we different? And we're not. That's a fact. So, you should, as the scriptures say, rejoice that God saved you. Right? That was my Sunday message. I got saved you. I mean, this is how I look at myself. I just I always consider myself just an ordinary guy. Just a, a regular guy. When I had pastors on staff, and I don't know, I used to tell them all, we are nobody special. We are blue-collar pastors. We do whatever it takes to get the job done. That's it. We don't get in limos. We don't have servants and whatever. Um, because that's the way I see myself, you know? Whatever, ha whatever has to be done to get the job done, that's what we do. So we're brethren, you know, brothers and sisters of low degree. But now, in, in verse 10 it says, but the rich, carrying on from the same thing, we should rejoice, in that he is made low. James will go on later to say how there was some discrimination in the early church. They had a lot of problems in the early church. We still have them now, too. So all of you ordinary people come in, you know, and you do what you do. But then all of a sudden, this really wealthy, popular guy comes in. So we clear off the front row, and we say, come on, you sit in the front. And here's, here's something that's unique. I mean, this is somebody that I can respect. The pastor of... Um, Assemblies got church in Memphis, Tennessee years ago. I think it was First Assembly in Memphis. Elvis Presley, when he was alive, would from time to time tell people, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a member of First Assembly in Memphis. And so he came to church one day. This is Elvis Presley I'm talking about. And uh, the pastor asked to see him after the service. All right, we're talking about Elvis Presley, right? And uh, the pastor spoke to him and said, he said, Elvis, don't tell people you're a member of this church, and I remember this church. It was your lifestyle, and he went through that. You see, that's, you know, and I, I, by the way, I, I happen to think that Elvis was a, a, just a good guy. I really do. He was, he was drug addicted, but, and other things, but, a few other things, but, uh, but I, I can admire a, a pastor like that. I can say, look at, here, you're just an ordinary guy, but the way you're living, that doesn't square with what the Bible teaches. So when a wealthy person comes, we are, we are exhorted not to treat them differently. We're also exhorted not to treat the poor people differently because we are all in Christ. Now, you've been part of a church, and I hope it wasn't this one, but uh, have you been in part of a church where people are walking around with an air kind of an attitude, you know, like, who are you? Why are you here? <laughs> Why are you in this church with us? Well, I've been around that. I've been around churches where they make, uh, they've made uh, leaders, I mean, leaders have made remarks about ethnicity. And these are the things that always confuse me because when I read the book, I know that's not what the book says. So, anyway. It, it goes on. You have people who, you know, I remember preaching a sermon in a friend of mine's church. I was there for three days. And I just felt, I, I, I don't, I don't uh, ever ask, you know, what would you like me to preach on or have somebody say to me, can you deal with this subject? They probably would if they asked me, but they never did. I prayed just like I do here. And I just felt real impressed to preach to this church, fairly large church, that um, the church was owned by Jesus, not by anybody in the congregation. So I went on and, and on and on and on for my typical one hour sermon. And the pastor came to me and he was really nervous. His hands were shaking because he was about to go through a church split. I did not know that. I just kept saying, you know, there's some of you sitting here and you think you own the church, but you don't. Well, he said to me, he says, tonight when you come back, Sunday night, you got to explain to the people that I did not tell you all these things. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? What, 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 you know, it's the problem. He says, you know, we have a group over here, whatever, they're, they're causing problems, and they've been around a while, and they had the money and influence. And uh, he was really shaken. The pastor was shaken. 
because the things that I was saying was so specific to the congregation that I had never been there before, and obviously I haven't been back since. Uh, three days or whatever it was of me was quite enough. I've never been back. Never been invited back. Um, it, was, it was true. You had this kind of, you know who we are, and we own the church. Well, let's set all this straight. From the Vatican to the Middle East, with the Eastern Orthodox branches of Eastern Orthodox uh, churches, and all the branches of Protestant, uh, Jesus owns the church. He is the head, always was the head, always will be the head, and that's how it goes. Nobody, nobody here because they're rich. But let's not, because uh, in America we've got things flipped around too, with uh, minority status and all this business. They say, well, you know who I am, you know, I've got problems, so, well, we're not going to put you in the front seat either. The fact is, we're all equal. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, every one of us, rich and poor and so forth. So the, the low, like you and me, we can rejoice. Did you ever think of what your life would have become, what would have become of your life if you didn't meet Christ, if you weren't born again? I mean, you don't know, and I don't know, but my guess is, my life, I don't think it would have been good. I really don't. Anyway, we're all here in low degree. Amen. And since we don't have too many rich people to offend, <laughs> it's all good. But if they come, they'll be welcome to a, a seat, but they're not going to kick you out of yours. I've seen that too. This is the truth. I've seen... Member, member of the church, new people come, a woman tap them on the shoulder and say, you're sitting in my seat. <laughs> yeah, that happened when we were up on the hill. Excuse me? Your seat? Well, oh, you know, keep that in mind. Wherever you're sitting tonight, and I know like you sometimes you switch and you mix up my memory, but um, it's not your seat. So... Look at verse 11. The sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass. And we're seeing quite a bit of that up, up here in upstate New York, right? Yellow grass. Good illustration when you're on your way home tonight. And the flower thereof falleth, so you try to keep your lawn looking good. And God says, I'm not going to hold, I'm going to hold back the rain for a month. And the grass of the fashion of it perishes so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways if you've uh, I've not read the whole book but Jim Baker after he went to prison uh, the first book that he wrote when he got out was I was wrong now some of you haven't been around in the Lord long enough to remember Jim Baker's show but you know, it was all about wealth and money and whatever and then, uh, then this is scary here's a guy who's preaching and teaching millions and millions of people states in his book but when I was in prison I read the Bible that's what preachers are supposed to do but I've told you before they don't ordinarily preachers, pastors I mean don't read the Bible they may do a devotion like you do but the pastor, especially if he's being paid compensated is supposed to be, that's supposed to be his job he's supposed to be an expert in the Bible to defend the faith and, and so forth. Okay. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. I was thinking about this, not that verse, but that concept just this afternoon. Um, actually, I was thinking about a cemetery. And again, like I've told you from time to time, I just, in my mind's eye, I don't know where I'm going to be buried. I don't know when I'm going to die. I don't know what, from what, when, the, you know, what day. I don't know. We haven't picked out a plot yet. My wife keeps saying we have to pick out one. That's kind of like depressing. <laughs> <laughs> when I pick out one that's near a brook, but that's a nice spot. Won't matter to me or her. But she tells me that's what we got to do, so follow instructions, you know. <laughs> but I keep thinking of that day when all these labors are over. And your hope should be that you can give to the Lord a good report. Or rather, his, he'll, he'll, he'll acknowledge you that your life really counted for something in his name. 
Blessed is the man that endures temptation. Let no man, verse 13, say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, meaning by God. See, God's putting these things in my way. Um, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. <laughs> now, you know, I'm talking about men. There's different types of lust. You understand that. It's not all sexual lust. You could lust for money, uh, other things. But we usually when we use the word lust, it brings up sexuality. And uh, I was watching a bunch of demonstrators a week back. <clears throat> demonstrating on something else, not whatever they're talking about now. What were they demonstrating about? I think it was critical race theory. So this black woman, she was really hot, arguing with this white woman who was saying, you know, America's racist. Now she's white and she's black and she's really hot saying, if you have, we have opportunity here, we have all this stuff. But when I looked at this poor woman, that white woman, man, she was so ugly. I said, finally God found a cure for sexual lust, uh, for men. I mean, she was just, uh, yeah, not only was she just wrong in her argument, but she w was not, not good looking to boot. But ordinarily, this is what happens with people. And lust, lust doesn't have to be sexual, it could be money, uh, and it could be what? Fame. It could be anything. It's, it's an excess, it's a simply an excess. Money is necessary in this life, but money is not the problem, it's the love of money and then whatever success is defined maybe by the individual. Um, that's a relative term, I think. Um, I've told people that all I ever really wanted from the beginning was peace. Right? That's all I really want. And uh, to this day, whenever I think about, I could do this and I could do that, and it's still time to do this, and it's still time to do that. I always keep coming back to it. All I ever really wanted was peace. And if I have peace, I feel like I'm successful. Yes, Pastor, you have something that I've been curious about for a long time. I saw the similarities in reading this. The use of the word temptation or tempted. So I looked it up in the Strong's, and it's pretty uh, encouraged me. The word temptation there in verse 12, and the same word we find again, uh, 3986. A putting to proof by experiment of good, experience of evil, solicitation, discipline, or provocation. So I see the, the definition of putting the proof. That's why being tempted, it's a refining or a, a putting the, to the test. Kind of the well, yeah, it's, it's not really. We have, we have, you know, kind of a problem in translation here, too, because uh, it will say in Genesis that the Lord tempted Abraham. So, you know, there's not always perfection in translation from Hebrew to English, Greek to English. But if you think about being tested, just being tested, um, that's the only way we can know if something is valid or not, is you test it, right? You put things in and you test them to see if it's working. So God does test us, but he doesn't, what this is saying, he doesn't tempt us to sin. He, that's what Satan does. And then our own nature, too. So that's what that verse is saying there. Either way, it does show what we're really made of when we're tested, either way. Now let me go a little further before we finish. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So I'll just stay on sexual lust for, well, mainly, I say guys now, you don't know it's guys, girls, but mainly men, because um, I've heard this before. So I don't know why God keeps putting these you know, beautiful women in my way. Well, he's not. The problem is inside you, not inside her. Uh, and it works both ways, men and women, for different reasons, I think. But um, the, the Bible is very clear. This is something that you're struggling with. It's not something God is doing. It's kind of easy to understand. It's your own lust. It's your own idea. This is what the washing of the water of the Word of God does. It takes all of this out. Let me go back to the cemetery for a minute. So uh, I'm thinking about doing a show for the Oasis because I have talked about it on one broadcast. But if I do it, I'm going to actually go to a cemetery and do the broadcast from there because the way I look at life, and I have looked at life 
all of my life is that it's going to have an end. And then what? Can you, can anybody go to any one of these local cemeteries or any cemetery really in the world? And there are some exceptions, like, you know, some famous or wealthy people, like the Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. Some very famous people buried there. Bat Masterson's buried there, Duke Ellington. So you can go by and see a, a big mausoleum, Duke Ellington, with his name on it. And Okay, so we understand them. But ordinarily in the cemetery, you don't know who made a lot of money, who didn't make a lot of money. It's all over. Mo mento more. Yeah. Latin for remember death. Remember, this is all going to come to an end. But we have the gift of eternal, eternal life. We've been given the gift of eternal life. That means this life will come to an end. <clears throat> and um, that, I, I truly believe, will be a blessing when we leave the body and we, we go to be present with the Lord. You know, it's, it's just beyond imagination how freeing that's going to be. To be just be with the Lord. In the, in the meantime, we're you know we're we're here. So let's let's go through this, and I'll finish for tonight. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, right? the breaking of God's commands. God said, "Don't do this." There you go. You did it. Um, and also, he got to do this, and you didn't finish what he said to do. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. We'll, we'll, we'll stop there and pick it up next week at verse 16. But I'm just giving you some things, you know, here and there that are helpful to me. They may not be helpful to you. What has been helpful to me all of my life is, especially if I'm frustrated or things didn't turn out my way, I, I listen to a lot of music. I listen to classical music, classical guitar, classical singing. I listen to oldies. Mostly um, with secular music, I'm listening to what were the words and lyrics I was listening to 50 years ago, 40 years ago. I'm, stu I'm always studying it. I'm studying what the various instrumentalists are doing and the singer, whatever, studying their voices. And uh, I just remembered the movie Jeremiah Johnson. Remember that? And so I wanted to study the song. Jeremiah Johnson went into the mountains, betting on forgetting all the troubles that he knew. But the song is all about basically this. It didn't go the way he thought it would go. So if you've seen the movie, you'll know that, right? Uh, and there was a real Jeremiah Johnson. His name was John Johnston. <clears throat> but... Life just doesn't seem to go the way we plan it. But if we have confidence in Christ, it's going the way that he planned it. I, when, I, when I first came here, it was 35 years ago. And my, my aim and my goal at the time was to live my entire, the rest of my life here. I was 33 years old when I came here. Sort of like either... Papillon, or uh, I don't know, someone in the Bastille. I said, wow, I was coming to the stairs tonight. I said, man, 35 years. I live another five, I'll be here 40 years. Um, it's with a Shawshank redemption. But you see, in my mind, regardless of whatever people think, I'm a success. In my mind. And why is that? Because God called me here and I stayed faithful. And it has not been an easy road. Now, if God says tomorrow you're to go and leave, then I'll leave. I'll go. I don't know what we'll do about the plot that we just bought. That my wife made me buy. I would ship me back here. I wanted to be buried in Yonkers. She don't want to be buried in Yonkers. But in my mind, that's success. I'm not looking for, and you shouldn't either, the applause of men. When I first came here 35 years ago, on several occasions, uh, people 
leaders of the ch various churches say, well, man, this is a stepping stone for you. That little town can never contain you and all this business. But I never saw it that way. I never saw the people of Amsterdam as a stepping stone for my career. You know, just step on your head and move on to the bigger things with the, with the better people. I, I, I don't know. I, I never saw it that way. I always saw it as that I'm at my post. I'm doing what I'm called to do. I'm doing my duty. And until I'm properly relieved, which will either come by God saying, I want you someplace else, or come up hither, then that's what we're to do. So until then, for you, it's pray. It's study the scriptures. It's reaching out to people with your own personality with, for, for Christ and with Christ. Being faithful right to the very end. That's success. No matter what all the other pundits are saying about success, this is, go to the cemetery and see if you can tell which one was rich, which one was poor. Only a mausoleum can make that distinction, but beyond that, faithfulness. Let's believe in God. Let's believe his word. Don't get drawn out by this world, uh, by your own nervous symptoms and your palpitations and whatever. Don't get drawn out, and, and listen to me say this kind of carefully. Don't get drawn out by your own family. Love them, certainly. Be faithful, yes, and loyal, but you're you. And Jesus taught us that lesson, too, that nobody comes before our love for him. Nobody. No. Nobody. So, Father, we come before you tonight, and here we are in this world, this crazy, chaotic world. It's filled with evil. But it's still filled with good, and probably more good than evil, because you're good. You can be found any place that men seek you. Help us to be faithful to the very end, faithful in our appointed rounds and duties. We just ask you tonight, Father God, to help us. Pour out your spirit on us, God. The results are in your hands. Help us to do what we were commanded to do, and help us not to do what we were commanded not to do. We're frail, we're weak, we need your help. We need your spirit, we need your word. In any case, God, I ask you to give everyone here tonight safe traveling mercies on the way home. Let them put their heads on the pillows and be able to really fall into a really deep recuperative sleep. For you give to your beloved in sleep. And we pray all these things tonight, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. I say amen tonight.